be saved, and thy house. Now, as I said, some of you, when I say that, you know, the statement that you don't need to repent of your sins in order to be saved, you look at me and you say, well, no, the Bible says right there in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, it says repent and believe the gospel, right? And you say, well, right there it says repent and believe the gospel. That's what Jesus said. He said he flat out said it. But, but then you go on and you read in Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31, where he, he says that, you know, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's no mention of repentance. And people say, well, you, you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. And I made this statement, you don't have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. You say, well, pastor, that sounds like doublespeak. Well, let's see what the Bible says, all right? What is true biblical repentance? What is true biblical repentance? By the way, the title of my sermon this morning is, Salvation Isn't Hard Nor Difficult, Change My Mind. Salvation isn't hard, change my mind. Getting saved is not hard. What's what you do afterwards that is hard. The Christian walk is hard, it's difficult. Why? Because you all of a sudden realize that God has a manual called the Bible that says this is how you're supposed to live life. You've been living contrary to it. God says, no, you got to live this way, and it's hard. Why? Because it's work. Because the things that you were doing, the Bible you know, may say, you know what, that's not right. And so all of a sudden, you, you sit there and you go, okay, pastor, what is true biblical repentance? Well, we must understand what the word repent means in the first place. Repent does not mean to turn away from your sins or to turn away from all of your sins. How do I know that? Is there one person in here that has ever turned away from every single sin in their life? That you're perfect now. There's only one perfect person, and that is Jesus Christ. And he's the Son of God, and they killed him for it. But praise be to God is that he resurrected on that third day. Amen? Amen. Repent simply means to turn or to change one's mind. That's simply what it means. It does not mean to turn away from all of your sin. It does not mean all that. All it means is to turn or change your mind. You say, well, how do you know this? God repents more than man in the Bible. Do you know that? God repents. God turns or changes his mind more than man does in the Bible. He's, it says that God repents. Actually, the first time in the Bible that's, that it's mentioned that, of repent, it's God doing it. He changes his mind or he, he turns away from the evil that he was, that he was going to uh, pour out upon people that were not doing what they were supposed to do. Here's an example, Genesis chapter 6, verse, verses 6 and 7. Like I said, God changes his mind or he turns away from you know, the wrath or the evil that he was going to pour out upon non-believers a lot of times. He does that with Jonah. Remember, you know, with those in Nineveh? He was going to take them out. Why? Because they were doing wicked and evil things. But they changed what they were doing. Or, you know, oh, sorry, they had a change you know, from their, their unbelief to belief on the Lord. And what does it say? God you know, uh, repented or turned from the evil that he was going to do to them, which was what? Take them out. He was going to, you know, kill them off. Why? Because they were doing such wickedness as well. But in Genesis chapter 6, verse uh, 6 and 7, <clears throat> this is the first time that re- uh, the word repented or repent is, is mentioned in the Bible. And it says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both men, both man and beast, and the creepy thing, and the uh, fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. So what is, you know, guys, you know, is God repenting of sin? Was it a sin that God created man or the beast, you know, the beast or the, the fowls of the air or the creeping things or anything else? No. God, you know, was, you know, it repented, you know, God changed or he said, you know what, I'm basically, uh, he, he changed, he turned, from the fact that he, uh, you know, he wanted him, and so he destroyed him. How did he destroy him? With a, a, a worldwide flood. Because of all that. God was, you know, remember in Genesis chapter 1, he said that he created, you know, man, and he said it was good. He created the world, it was good. All these things were good until what? The fall happened, and then things began to go bad, and then God says, you know what? I'm, basically, I'm sad that, that I've made these people, 
I should have never made them, and so I'm going to destroy them. But he still didn't destroy everyone, did he? He kept, uh, he kept Noah and his family around, didn't he? And so what we see in here is the fact that God's not repenting of sin. He's, he's turning away, you know, he's saying, you know what? They were good. I'm turning, I'm, I'm going to turn them over to wrath. And we see, you know, uh, that's also like, a, you know, we can look at it as being an end times you know, kind of thing as well because it actually does allude to that. So God doesn't need to turn from sin. Why? Because he's perfect. He's perfect. He's without sin. We see this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. It says, For we have not a high priest, which uh, cannot be touched with uh, the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So God was, you know, Jesus Christ, God was tempted in all ways, right? Like as we are. But he didn't sin. So God doesn't need to repent of sin, right? He doesn't need to turn from sin. But yet it says in Genesis 1, you know, 6, people go, well, that right there. There's other examples I'm going to bring up. And so I'm hoping that I'm you know, you know, uh, making this as clear as I can. I have taken some cough medicine, so... So the next question is, you say, well, pastor, then is repentance needed for salvation? Do we need to repent in order for, uh, to be saved? Now, this is where you're going to sit there and all of a sudden you're, that eyebrow is going to cock up in the air and go, didn't you just say, do you need to repent for salvation? Yes, but not for sin. I see some of those eyebrows going up. In order for salvation, yes, you need to repent, but not of your sins. What you need to repent of is your unbelief. Because remember, you can't turn from every single sin in your life. But you're turning from your unbelief to belief in the Lord Jesus Christ at salvation. You're saying, I didn't believe, but now I do believe, and I believe that God is the only one that can save me. That's the repentance that you need to do at salvation. One of the biggest uh, uh, scriptures that people will go to and say, well, you need to repent of all your sins. That's, this is what the Bible teaches. And they'll go to Acts chapter 17 if you want to turn there. Acts chapter 17. Our uh, clock died up there, so that just means I can preach as long as I want to this morning. <laughs> Tim laughs because he's the one who, who has a face down because it's just showing the temperature. So if you want to know, it's about 71.4 degrees. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 22, going through uh, verse 30, it says this. The Bible says, Then Paul stood in, uh, in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom, he, uh, whom therefore ye ignorantly worshipped. Him uh, declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he, is needed, he needed anything, seeing he, give, uh, he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for, uh, to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times uh, before appointed and the bounds of, of their habitation that uh, they, uh, they should seek the Lord if happily they, uh, they might feel after, uh, after him and find him though he, uh, he be not far from every one of, uh, every one of us for in, in him we live and move and have our being as certain also uh, of your own poets have said for we are also the, uh, his offspring for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto, uh, unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And they'll sit there and they'll read this and they'll sit there and say, right there he says that everyone needs to repent in order to be saved. But does it say that? He is going through, what Paul is telling them to repent of is worshiping idols, false gods. 
that unbelief. They're believing in a false God. They're believing not on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says you need to repent of that because you can stop that. And you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can turn from worshiping false gods. How do you do that? You don't do it. If you have you know, idols in your house or a statue, you can do as they did in the Bible. Destroy them. If you have a book of witchcraft or whatever in your house, what do you do? Throw it away. Burn it. I say burn it because of the fact that if you throw it away, there's a possibility somebody can find it. If you have a Quran in your house, get rid of it. This is how you, you would repent. Part of the fact, obviously, you don't believe what the Quran says anymore. You don't believe what Buddha says anymore. You don't believe what the, the book of sorcery says anymore. You believe what the Bible says. And you, because why? Because the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ. That's what he's telling them to turn away from. It's turning away from, uh, turning away, uh, away from that, un, you know, that unbelief that you had and now, uh, the unbelief that you had in Jesus Christ, and now you're saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. That's the repentance that you need. And I'm going to reiterate this. Turning away from every single sin in your life that is, you have ever committed is impossible. Because think about it. There's probably things that you did as a child and you weren't saved. Did you repent of that? The Bible says that the thought of foolishness is sin. Have you done that? And are you still perfect in that of not having a thought of foolishness? You would have to be perfect. Plain and simple, what Paul is telling them, that every single uh, religion, including false Christian denominations, except for true biblical Christianity, says that you must work your way into heaven. These false religions that say you must repent of every single sin in your life in order to be saved, is it, what they're saying is that you must work your way to heaven. And you say, well, no, that's not possible. You can't work your way to heaven. Exactly. But when they say that you must repent of every single sin in order to be saved, that is exactly what they are telling you. And that's exactly what they're... Because the thing is, is that... Think about it. If you have to repent of every single one of... If I have to repent of every single one of my sins, who's in charge? I am. Because it's my sin. I'm trusting in me to get everything straight. And I can screw it up. And I probably will. But when I, you know, when I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm trusting in him to save me, who am I trusting in? Jesus Christ and not myself. There's some that say, you know, you must do enough good works to beat out the bad works. You're right in there with, with Islam, with Buddhism, with all that. I mean, Buddhism is a strange religion if you, haven't, if, if you never looked it up. Buddhism is the fact of that, that when you die, you come back as something else. And you're hoping that it's something cool. There was a lady that, that I saw, you know, uh, she was talking about her Buddhist belief. And she says, I'm hoping to come back as a, as, as a whale. It's not the first thing that I would think of, but... She said the reason why is because in Buddhism that, you know, the more graceful and angelic-like and, and freer, that means that you did really well in the, in the previous life. This is a bunch, of, a bunch of hogwash, by the way. And that's the reason why. I was like, why would you want to do that? I kind of had this ideology when I was a kid because I was playing make-believe, which everybody knows that make believe's not real, Right? I wanted to be a gliding squirrel because I thought it'd be cool. Because you just go and then you just fly anywhere you want to go, you know. And you just go in there and all this other stuff. But, why, but that's a fantasy. Why? Because I was a kid. And I wasn't saved at the time either. I mean, I had ideas of that, hey, you know what? You know, I even had dreams, I remember, of, of me wanting to fly like Superman. That's a fantasy world. I can't fly. There's only going to be one time I'm going to fly. Either, you know, either I'm going to be dead in the ground and the Lord's going to call me home or I'm going to be walking this earth and the Lord's going to call me home and he said, and all those who are dead in Christ and those that all, you know, live shall go be with him in heaven. Then I'll fly. I'll have my Superman experience no matter what, you know, on that one. But the fact is, is that everything else is fantasy. It's all make-believe. But yet you have people out there thinking that everything is true. We even see this, you know, uh, the fact of that turning from idols is what, 
um, you know, uh, that repentance, you know, the repentance of turning away from unbelief is in First Thessalonians chapter one verse nine, which says, "For they themselves show of us what manner of of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned uh, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God." That is repentance. That is salvation repentance. That you turn away from the false things that you were believing, and you say, I'm going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's turning away from, you know, it's, it's turning from unbelief to belief on the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, but wait, I was always told that repentance is not a work. Right? No, it's wrong. We see in Jonah, I was just talking about them a little bit earlier, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10 says this, And God saw their works, that they had turned from their evil way. Is that now how modern Christianity tries to say that biblical repentance is? Do they say that it's turning away from every single, you know, every single bad thing? It says, and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do, uh, that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But you know what? God still called their way evil, and that you know, turning away from that way was a work. Anytime that you repent of a sin in your life, it's work. Is it not? If you, have, if you cuss like a sailor, and you say, I don't want to cuss anymore. I say that because that was one of the things I struggled with when I first was newly saved. Is it not work to sit there and try and get your mouth under control to not say those words? Or if you're you know, an alcoholic, is it not work to try and stop being an alcoholic? Or if you're a drug addict? Or if you eat a lot? Uh-oh. Pastor, that's like fast food. I mean, that's not what America is founded upon. By the way, America is like known as the most obese nation in the world, by the way. But the Bible you know, talks about gluttony as being a sin. That's all hard work. You know what's hard work? We just had January 1st. What happens on January 1st? Most times people say, oh, I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to go to the gym and work out. Right there, that ought to tell you. That's a work. You're repenting of the bad habit that you did, and you said, I'm going to go work out. What are you working out? The fat. You're working out that fat and you're trying to get that fat to be gone. Repentance is a work. God's word calls repentance a work. Why? Because it's work. Plain and simple. But God's work upon the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection, that's what we're trusting in for salvation. Salvation isn't hard or difficult. There are two ways, you know, there, do you know that there are two ways a person could be saved from hell? You say, no, Pastor. This is where the eyebrow, you know, you know, cocks up a little bit and going, all right, Pastor's preaching heresy now. There, are, there is, there's, there's two ways to heaven. The first one is that you have to be perfect. Are you perfect? Now that rule is that one out. All right. The second one is obviously believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way you're going to get here. How do you say that, Pastor? Well, you know, because there's people out there that actually believe that they are perfect, that they have stopped sinning. A lot of them come out of, you know, one of, you know, one of the ones that I, you know, that I remember of is they were a part of the Hebrew Roots Movement, which basically says that, you know, that they're going to believe that they're going to follow the entire Old Testament law. But then when you speak to them, they say, well, no, we just... We just keep the laws that we know that we can keep. I said, so you have a giant magic marker on the ones that you can't? I mean, how is that not a man-made religion when you're, when you're basically saying, well, we're only going to keep the ones that we can keep? And that's how you're going to do it. But James right here, James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point is guilty of all. So that person that tells you that they're perfect, that they stop sinning, is lying to you because, you know what, if they offend at one point, they're guilty of them all. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says this. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So for a person that will come up to you and say, I have never sinned, they are lying to your face. 1 John says that he that says that they were without sin is a liar. So who are you trusting? Are you trusting in yourself to save you? Or are you trusting in Jesus Christ to save you? 
Because when you say I, you know, that I must repent of all my sins in order to be saved, you're trusting in yourself to do that. But when you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're trusting in him to save you, you're believing on him to do all that, that's the person who is saving you. And you know what? God's better at saving than I am. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14 says this. It says, but because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So when we read this, it's, you know, the word you know, straight, that synonym, that S-T, or the S-T-R-A-I-T is a synonym for the word narrow. Jesus is just reiterating that it is a narrow way and that there are few people that find it. That's all he is saying. But you have some translations or some modern versions that say that, say that you know, that, that says that, that it is hard to get to heaven, that it is difficult. Is that what the Bible says? No, the Bible just says that it's narrow. The Bible never says that it's hard. It just says that it's narrow. Why? Because there are going to be few people that find it. That's it. And so to me, it's like if you have that translation that says that it's hard or difficult, I get rid of that translation because that's not what the Bible says. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because you know what? If you go online, you can look up you know, the Greek and see what the actual Greek word says, and the Greek word never says hard or difficult. It says narrow. It says narrow is the way. It doesn't say difficult is the way. It doesn't say hard is the way. It says narrow is the way, which leads to light. Why? Because when you go knock on a door or you go talk to somebody about Jesus Christ, people don't want to believe on Jesus Christ. And if you don't... People have an easier time, quote-unquote, getting saved when you say you have to repent of your sin. Why? Because it puts it back in their hands. Because they want to trust in themselves to get to heaven. And you say, well, they would never say that. They wouldn't say that, but that's exactly what they mean. Why? Because like other religions, we think that if we do, uh, you know, that we think if we do enough good things that somehow that's going to you know, help us get to heaven without having to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the same you know, issue that you'll see throughout the Bible for those people that don't get saved. It's because of the fact that they will trust in themselves to get saved. People don't want to do it. We've shared the gospel. We've had people right there, and I said, all it is is to believe on the Lord Jesus. Do you want to do that? No, that's too easy. That seems a little bit too easy. I don't think that's right. Why do we make it harder on ourselves or why do other people want to make it harder on somebody else? Why? Because they want to take people with them to hell. Do you ever wonder why you had somebody, quote unquote, that was following the Lord, but all of a sudden you know, lost their salvation or turned away? It's because they were taught a false gospel of the fact that they had to repent of all their sins. And they go on and they say, well, it's going to be a little bit of a process because there's a lot of sin that I had in my life. But I'm going to get my life straight and I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to get better. But then as the months go by, as the, you know, or the days go by, the months go by, the years go by, they keep on trying to repent or get whatever, you know, that out of their life, and they keep on having that same struggle over and over again. They say, well, you know, obviously, I can't do this. Something must be wrong with my Christianity, and I can't do this. And so they say, you know what, forget it, I'm not going to do it. They're like, if it's this hard, you know, to get saved and follow Jesus Christ, I'm not going to do it. Jesus did not make it hard, we do. Jesus said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Jesus did all the work, you know, the hard work for us. They want their faith in something that they've created. That's where we get false religions from and cults. They want to have their faith in something that they've created that they can control and they can manipulate other people with. Salvation is by faith alone. Salvation is a free gift. Jesus Christ did all the work. Where? With a death, burial, and resurrection upon the cross. He did the work, so we didn't have to, because we couldn't. As we're going to read here in a few moments, salvation is easy. I've, I'm going to reiterate again. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, believe on him alone, and his death, burial, and resurrection. The way to heaven is narrow because it's through Jesus Christ. It's not hard or difficult, as some translations say. 
And why do I bring up translations? Because the translations are being manipulated by these false religions and putting that in there. Do you know, and I don't know, you know, I'm going to bring this up, and this is probably, you know, a hot topic. Did you know that there is one Bible translation that, uh, that evangelicals, or as we would say us, you know, use and say that they believe, that actually includes repent of your sins in order to be saved? And that is the New Living Translation. If you have that Bible, I would burn it and get rid of it. The fact that, that there is one that's out there promoted as a Christian Bible and yet tells you to repent of all your sins in order to be saved, do you know where they got that from? The Mormons. And that doctrine, you know, that Mormon doctrine, is a racist doctrine. You say, well, how is that possible? Because they teach that the more that you repent of your sin, the holier you are, and the whiter your skin will get. So don't go down to the beach and get a tan. You're going to have to do some heavy duty repenting. Or by chance you have darker skin, I don't know, go have surgery and see if they can bleach your skin to make it whiter. I don't know, according to them. Why do I bring up you know, uh, some of the false religions? That there is, a, that there is a, another translation where the, the, uh, the chief executive, you know, the, the person that was in charge of the translation of the Old Testament was a known homosexual. There was another person on the same translation now, this is not about translations this morning, but I'm just going to go off on you know, this little tangent for a moment. Where she was a known lesbian, but they used her for stylistic purposes to make sure that it was able to be easily read. But yet, you know, her suggestion was used in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, where she changed the fact where it said, you know, it talks about you know, sodomites or anything else, and it, she changed it to homosexual offenders. So in other words, if, you're offend, uh, you know, if, if a homosexual has offended you, then it's wrong. But if they haven't, it's okay. Do you want to know what translation it is? It's the number two uh, most selling Bible in the world. And it's the New International Version. And yet, people go out there, and I, just, I went on it last night just looking. And the NIV says, well, you know what, uh, this person, you know, they worked on it, but it really didn't affect it. They were on there through the entire process, and then when they found out later, they're like, oh yeah, we probably shouldn't have had that, we probably shouldn't have had her on there. She was a liberal theologian, she left her husband, you know, uh, you know uh, for, for a woman, and was known, but while she was working on it, she, she kept that to herself. And you say, well, they didn't know, because she kept that to herself. What about the guy that was translating the Old Testament? They knew it. He was out and about about it. And yet, he translated the Old Testament. Where, are, where is the vast majority of, of verses that speak against homosexuality? In the Old Testament. You will not find sodomy, sodomite, or any other word referring to that activity in the Old Testament in the New International Version. Why? Because you had a homosexual that was in charge of the translation. You say, well, that's just coincidence. Really? Back from my rabbit trail. And if you're sitting there and you say, you know what, that you, you, know, that you don't believe me, you say that salvation is not by faith alone. It's not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to do, there must be something I have to do. That I, I have to like repent of my sins. Let's go to the book in the Bible in which the whole writer's point and purpose, the whole reason, the whole scope, the whole focus that he wrote the book was to tell people how to be saved. Gospel of John. Uh, uh, John chapter 20, verse 31. The Bible reads, But these things are written that ye, may be, uh, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have eternal life, or life through his name, eternal life through his name. What does he tell you? He says, you know what, I'm writing this entire book. Why? Why? That you might have life through his name. Life refers to eternal life. He says, that's the whole reason I'm writing this gospel. And you know what word is magically not there? In the Gospel of John, repent. But you have it almost, you have it nearly a hundred times where he says, believe, 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 just in the Gospel of John alone. And the entire Gospel is written that you may know how to be saved, which is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a hundred times where it says, believe. 
or nearly 100 times, you know, that it says believe in John, and repent does not appear once. You think that if it was, re, you know, repent, re, you know, repent of all your sins, it would appear only at least once, but it's not in there, it's not in there at all. Even in that last sentence, even that, you know, that, that, that verse that I just read to us, it tells you how to get saved. Let's read John 20, verse 31. It says, but these things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that ye believing, ye might have life through his name. How do you get saved? Believing. That he is the only one that can give you eternal life. He's the only one that can save you. Let's look at a few more verses, and I'm not going to go through every single verse in the Gospel of John that talk about, you know, how do you, uh, how do you get saved and, and all that, but I'm going to read a few to you that are plainly speaking of salvation. Now, while I'm reading about salvation, notice that there's no mentions of repenting of your sins or keeping the commandments or any of that. John chapter 1, verse 7. John 1, 7, the Bible reads, The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him, what? Might believe. That all men might, you know, through him might believe. It doesn't say that they might repent. It says that they might believe. John 1, 12, we're saying in the same chapter. Go down a few verses, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that what? Believe on his name. It right there is talking about the fact that if you receive him, if you believed on him, you receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your life, what does it say? It says that he gave you power to become sons of God, that what? Even to them that believe on his name. Now, when you become a son of God, it's not talking about you become, you become the son of God because that's Jesus Christ. He's saying, you know what? You're part of God's family. Flip over a couple of pages over to John chapter 3. Verse 15, it says, That whosoever, what? Believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. Go down a verse. John three sixteen. Miss Pat teaches this to the little children, and you know, I'm, I'm sure that, um, that you've heard this verse. You might have seen it somewhere before. But it says, for God so loved the world. You can say it with me if you want to, because I know you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Tells you the gospel right there. Go down a few more verses in John chapter 3, verse 36. Verse 36 of John chapter 3, it says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not, the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. A couple more verses that I'm going to go through. You say, well, Pastor, come on now. I'm not giving you 100. I'm only giving you about 6 or 7. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believe." And what? Believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is what? Passed from death unto life. Have you heard the word repent yet? No. John six twenty nine. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God. This is the work that he did, that ye believe, you believe on him whom he hath sent. That's the work that he did, that you would believe on him. Go down a few verses in John chapter 6, to verse 47. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Do I need to make it more clear that it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? It's not repenting of all your sin because you can't do it. You're not perfect. It's trusting in Jesus Christ alone that what his work did, his death, burial, and resurrection was enough to save you. That is it. It's not hard. You're not going to change my mind on it. Because why? Because that's what the word of God says. It says it, and I believe it. If you, if you want to do that, you want to believe that you've got to repent of all your sins, you know what? Have fun in hell. Because that's what you're basically saying, that it's okay. 
I don't want to trust in my own works because you know what? I know that, you know what? I screw up my life every single day. But I know that I'm not going to you know, screw up the fact of salvation. Why? Because it's not on me to do it. Jesus Christ is the one saving me. So if you know, if you or someone you know has believed falsely, has believed the false gospel of repenting of your sins in order to be saved, then they are not saved or you're not saved. You say, how dare you say that, Pastor? How dare you tell me that I'm not saved? What does the Bible say? Matthew chapter 7. See what Jesus has to say. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. I do have a clock up here, so don't worry. I'm not going to go, you know, like super late. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21, it says, Now uh, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of God. But he that doeth the will of my Father, what was his will? That you would believe on him. All right? Which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in, uh, in thy name have cast out de uh, devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He is saying, you know what? All these ones are going through that are saying, you know what? You know what? You know, come on, Jesus. You know what? I prophesied in your name. I cast out devils. You know, I did many wonderful works. And Jesus says, I never knew you. Why? Because they were trusting in themselves to get saved, and you can't do that. They were trusting in their repentance of all of their sin, which they can never do. And Jesus says, I never knew you. It's not the fact that Jesus said, you know, I knew you at one time. He says, I never. What does the word never mean? Never. Never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Why? Because you're believing in the fact of you saving yourself and you can't do it. Like I said, so what is the will of the Father that he speaks of? John chapter 6, verse 38. Through 40, it says, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will. He's flat out going to tell you what it is. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me, I shall lose nothing. So what does that tell you about your salvation? You can't lose it. Uh-oh. Yeah, you can't lose it. Why? Because it doesn't depend on you. It depends upon Jesus Christ. If it depended upon you, you'd lose it like you lose your car keys. Or your phone. I say that, you know, some people will say, where's my phone? I think some people, like, their phone is more lost than they actually have it. Like, where's my phone? I don't know. Let's get to you to read. It says, and this is the, the Father's uh, will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I shall lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, and what? Believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's a promise of God. The promise of God says, you know what, that he's going to save you, you can't lose it, and you know what, you're going to get resurrected on the last day. Amen? Is that not the gospel? Praise the Lord, my voice is holding out. His will is that you would believe on him. We say, well, how can you know, or how can people say that they are not saved when they don't know him? The people, Jesus is talking about those who are trusting in their works to save them, as we saw in Matthew chapter 7. They are trusting in their ability to turn away and stay turned away because, you know what, once you turn away from sin and you, you repent of sin, you've got to stay away from it. You can't go back to it, right, if you want to be perfect. So you've got to stay away from it, from all the sins that you've ever done, in order to stay or keep your salvation, they are not trusting in Jesus Christ to save them. They are trusting in themselves. They are trusting in their righteousness, their righteousness and not his. 
That's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible says. And again, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, And as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 4, verse 3 says this, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto righteousness. Abraham believed God, so he was saved, and it was, it was credited or counted to him as righteousness. Romans 3.22 says this, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ upon all and, or, you know, unto all and upon all them that believe, there is no difference. He is telling you that it is by faith. Amen? That should be exciting. That it is by faith and not you. That gets me a little excited. Welcome 2024. When we think that we can lose our salvation in Jesus Christ, we have believed falsely and we need to be saved. Why? It's a false gospel. So how do I know that? Well, I just read you the part where Jesus said that, you know what, that he's not going to lose anyone. Well, let's read some more. John chapter 10. Because remember, John tells us all, you know, over 100 verses about how to be saved, right? He also tells us other things. He tells us how long e eternal life is and when you get it. Do you know that you get eternal life as soon as you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Because there's a false teaching out there that says, well, you don't get eternal life until you die and you've remained faithful to the Lord. So in other words, if you haven't kept on repenting and you know, stayed away from those things, you're not going. It's heresy. John chapter 10, starting at verse 28 and 29, says, And I give unto them eternal life. Who gives it to you? Jesus Christ. And they shall never perish. Are you going to perish? you going to go to hell? No, why? He says, they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You can't mess it up. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So who is able to get you out of God's hand? Who is able to take away your salvation? No one. The previous verses in John and throughout the Bible, when it was referring to salvation, it will tell, you know, and it, and if, it says that if you have believed, it always says that you, ha that you hath everlasting life, which is you have it's present tense. You have eternal life. It's not something that you get in the future. You have it. Why? Because if you mess up today, you know what? You still get eternal life. If you die today, you still get eternal life. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's never a mention, of, the Bible never mentions the fact of losing your salvation. The only way you can do it is if you take a verse and you isolate it and twist it and make it say what you want it to say. That's the only way. And if you say, well, Pastor, I still don't believe you. John chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Meaning, in no way am I going to cast you out. He said, if I, you've believed, I'm not going to cast you out. There's no way possible I'm going to do it. Now, the Bible does speak of the fact of us receiving consequences in this life for our sins. Right? I mean, think about it. If I stub my toe, what's the consequence? It's going to hurt. If I drink alcohol, the consequence is that I could you know, be drunk or get behind the wheel. and kill. There are natural consequences for the sin in, uh, in this life. But it's not double jeopardy. You're not going to get... Um, you're not going to get uh, uh, you accounted for the sin you know, in, in the everlasting life. It's not going to be like you're, you get penalized here and you're going to get penalized in heaven. You get penalized here for making the bad, you know, that bad choice, that sin. But you're not getting penalized in heaven. Now, if, you're, you, know, if, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you, get a, you, do, you do get double duty. You do get double jeopardy. You get penalized here and you get penalized there. The ones we, uh, who receive the consequences, both in this life, like I said, 
um, are those who have not put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ to save them. This would be those who are not Christians or false Christians. You say, Pastor, are there false Christians? There's a whole lot of people that I think that they are saved and are not. There's a lot of those churches. To go back to the original question, and I end with this. Do you need to repent of all your sins in order to receive salvation? No. You don't need to repent of all your sins in order to be saved. Should you repent or turn from your sins, sense your salvation because you have believed on him and you are trusting in him alone to save you? Yes. You should turn away from your sin. You should try to get those sins out of your life. Why? Well, think about it. If you're married and there was something that you do that annoys your spouse, I mean, you could be like the antagonist and just say, I'm going to keep doing it just to annoy him. Or you can turn away from it because you say, you know what, I don't want to annoy them because I love them. The final question is, will you ever be sinless or perfect in this life? I think I've answered that question. But I'll say it again. You're never going to be perfect. Never. That is why we all need Jesus. Because Jesus Christ did it all. And so I wanted, you know, to say this, you know, and, whatever, and to clear up all that, because like I said, I was getting that you know, kind of cockeyed look of going, well, Pastor, what are you saying? The Bible does say repent and believe the gospel. What that verse is saying, it says repent ye and believe the gospel. It is saying turn from your unbelief and you do what? Believe the gospel. Plain and simple, but people want to make it more difficult. Like right there, repent of all your sins. It doesn't say that. If you want that theology, go become a Mormon. If you want that theology, become a Mormon. If you want to believe the Bible and you want to go to heaven, believe what the Lord says, and he says, believe on me, and you shall have everlasting life. Amen? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that is so clear, so concise. And Lord, I thank you again, Lord, that if we believe upon you, we have eternal life. Thank you, God, that we cannot mess it up that we cannot you know, screw it up or anything else because it does not depend upon us. It is all upon you. Thank you, God, for this new year and these new opportunities and, uh, that we have. Lord, help us that we would use 2024 for your glory, that we would redeem the time as we talked about last week, and that we see many people come to know you, that people would believe on you, Jesus, they stop trusting in their, in their, own, you know, their own thoughts and everything, uh, their own thoughts, their own ways, their own false religions, their own control. And they say, Lord, I believe on you. Why? Because you did it all. And Lord, I pray that if there is a person that is listening to this, that has believed that false gospel, that they, that they must repent of all of their sins in order to be saved. God, I pray, God, that they would get saved this day that they would repent of that false ideology, that false doctrine, and say, you know what? No, I'm believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that's going to save me, that he is the only one that can save me. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.